Okay, it's 1.30 and I'm going to start uh, with the keynote. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining today. I um, really look forward to having an interesting conversation with you about the work that I do within large companies, helping them create the functionality that they need to, in order to drive lean and agile practices. Uh, while, while I'm speaking, uh, please, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box, but the chat box, uh, type them in the Q&A box. And then at the end of the keynote, um, I'll be able to go to the Q&A box and, 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 and answer your questions. There is a functionality there in the Q&A, if all of you open the Q&A, for you to be able to upvote and vote for, 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 for questions you think are, are really good. And then those ones will percolate to the top. And then I'll start by answering those questions when we, once we get to the point where I'll be um, answering questions. And so today I'm really gonna be talking about, you know, how entrepreneurs or innovators inside large companies can really drive the transformation that allows organizations to become much more innovative. And it's a really interesting conversation because, you know, for the last few years, we've been doing battle with leaders, trying to convince them that they should be driving more innovation inside their organizations. And now we're getting to a point where they're saying, okay, we get it, we agree. So now what do we do? Like, how do we actually get innovation done within the companies that, 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 that we're running? And so that's the concept that I, I, you know, I call Pirates in the Navy, which is, you know, innovators working inside large companies. But before I get to this sort of, you know, to, sort of to, to, to this conversation, let's just sort of talk a little bit about this distinction between pirates and, and, and the Navy. It was Steve Jobs who said, it's better to be a pirate than to join the Navy, right? And the reason he was saying this was he was trying to make a distinction between startups and entrepreneurs versus people that work inside large companies where they struggle with actually moving at, at speed. But as our leaders are starting to accept that they need to innovate, right? This distinction between being a pirate and being part of the Navy is actually becoming sort of not really useful, right? So what, in, what, what entrepreneurs need to become is actually they need to become pirates in, in the Navy. Now, just because we're working in, in, inside large companies doesn't mean that we stop recognizing the importance of the distinction between exploring for new ideas where you have to engage in sort of search behaviors, right? That's a really important part of exploring, of exploring new ideas. You're kind of searching, right? Whereas when you're exploiting your currently successful business, right? You're managing growth, you're, you're managing efficiencies, you're executing on known customers and delivering value to known customers and delivering known products using known the business models. Now, even though we have this distinction between searching and growing, it's really important that you know, companies are able to manage both. And so to build an invincible company, you really need to create this, this sort of harmony between these, these, these two parts of the business. Now, what, what tends to happen with entrepreneurs, which is something that I, 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 I've kind of noticed is they tend to exist at the periphery of organizations, describing themselves as rebels, disruptors, et cetera. But the really great entrepreneurs or great innovators that I've kind of worked with or sort of read about are the ones that really know how to navigate their organization and really embed themselves within the culture and become an important part of the organization. And so that's the conversation that I'd like to have with you, which is, you know, how do we become an, an important and key function within our organization? And so before I, I, proceed, I proceed even further, I'd like to ask you a question. And, and this question, you will be able to respond by a poll that will be launched in a, in a second. But the question is really about this. When you think of the innovation teams within the company that you work, right, how easy would it be for leaders to get rid of this, of this team? How easy would it be for leaders to just disband this team? You know, would it, be, would, it, would it be as difficult as getting rid of a key function like finance, right? Or is it almost a key function? Or would it be as easy as getting rid of external consultants, right? And so how easy would it be for leaders to get rid of the innovation team or disband it or just cut its funding? And so if you could launch the first poll, please, and people can respond to that. Always, every time I run this poll, the winning option is always, we're being treated as almost external consultants, right? And, and, and actually in the, in the work that I've been doing, Right, the, 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 and you can stop sharing out in, 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 in the work that I've been doing and as many times as I've run the polls, the numbers look exactly the same with the whole idea that innovators are like external consultants actually sort of taking up 60 to 70% of the, of the options there. So the question that really matters because if we wanna drive innovation as something that companies do as a repeatable process, we need to become more than just external consultants. We need to become as important as a, as a key function like finance. 
And I really strongly believe that, you know, in the same way that managing uh, budgets and managing marketing was something that was really important in the last two centuries for companies to sort of come to grips with, I actually think that creating continuous innovation and building agility and lean practices within organizations, that is the key problem for them to solve right now because the world is changing so rapidly. And with COVID-19, we really see the acceleration of these kinds of changes, right? And so it becomes really important for companies to build this, this, this functionality. So the question becomes, how do we as innovators or how do we as entrepreneurs drive this change and make sure that we, we sort of gain the status that's really necessary for us to become lasting contributors within the organization that, that we work? And so I went back to the private metaphor that we often use when we're describing innovation. And, and, I, and I suddenly realized that we tend to conflate the terms pirates and buccaneers, right? And we kind of use these terms inter, 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 interchangeably. Pirates, buccaneers, are, are you know, we... we we, we don't really make a distinction between different types of pirates. And then as I was looking deeper into this, in, 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 into this space, I noticed that there was another word to describe pirates and that was the word a privateer. And so this distinction between a pirate and just a privateer was, was, was something that I thought would be useful in, in really trying to sort of explain what we mean when we say entrepreneurs are not just entrepreneurs working inside large companies, right? So traditionally, a pirate is simply just a criminal. They roam the high seas. They're unattached to any institution. They're not really part of any larger organization. And if they're caught, right, they will be, they will be killed. Now, a privateer is also a pirate. But these were pirates that were commissioned by a specific government to raid, you know, the ships of enemy states, right? And so, uh, you know, famous privateers include like Sir Francis Drake and Sir Walter Raleigh, who were described as Queen Elizabeth the First pirates, and their goal was like to target Spanish ships. Now, what's interesting about this distinction is that, you know, both of them are engaged in sort of pirate activity, but the difference between a privateer and a pirate is that one is attached to a certain institution that is able to celebrate their success if they should ever accomplish it. So if you take that concept and try and apply it to innovators working inside large organizations, there's actually distinctions you can start to make. So if you're a pirate, right, you know, leaders, they don't really care about your work, right? You're just sort of working on the, on the, on the periphery. You might be walking around talking about disruption, but nobody's really paying attention to, to what you're doing. Whereas if you're a privateer, the leaders within your organization are fully invested in, in, in your success in, in, in terms of your status, if you're just a pirate or, or a rebel, as sometimes innovators call themselves, you have very low sort of power within your organization and your success is not celebrated. A lot of innovators I've actually worked with, they find that they can create something useful for their organization and then nobody wants to take it to scale, right? So, if, but, but, but if you're a privateer, you're connected to the main institution, so your success is gonna be widely celebrated. In, in terms of, of, of resources, if you're, if you're a pirate, your resources are inconsistent and likely to be cut. You might need to have a diplomat or some person who provides you cover while you do your work. But if that person gets fired or gets reassigned to a different post, then your status changes completely in terms of access to, 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 to funding. But if you are a privateer, your fundings are consistent and they're also likely to be actually in, increased over time. And then in terms of the projects that you work on, most people that function as pirates in, inside organizations, they, they have to nurse their projects and protect them from the mother company. So if they're discovered, they're likely to be killed, those projects, even if they're viable. And whereas if you're a, 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 a privateer, right, you're, you know, you're, 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 your projects matter. Somebody cares about what, what you're doing. And so the important statement or the important distinction to make here is that if you're a pirate, the only thing people care about is finding you and stopping you from doing what you're doing. Whereas if you're a privateer, there's at least some people inside the organization that care about the success of, of, of what you're working on and they have a vested interest in you becoming successful. And so that's what we want to do. We want to transition from being just rebels, pirates, and underground movement to becoming a much more institutionalized version of the same kinds of work that we, of the same kind of work that we're trying to do. So the question becomes, how do we actually make that transition? And so the first thing that I really like to speak about when I'm speaking to entrepreneurs is how authentic they are 
when they're driving these sorts of practices, right? Because I've worked inside large companies and I've worked with entrepreneurs that have really, really huge egos, right? They walk around and carry themselves as if they're Elon Musk and they're complaining about MBAs and how they work in a company full of idiots and how they just don't get it and how they're gonna get disrupted and look what happened to Blockbuster, look what happened to Nokia. If you don't work with us, your company's not gonna get saved. This sort of huge ego. And I can always tell which innovator is gonna crash and burn by the attitude and tone that they bring to their work, right? The more egotistical and vain they are, the more likely they are to fail because trying to drive innovation inside large companies is, is hard as it is, right? So you don't really want to sort of make enemies, people that are rooting for you to fail when you're actually trying to do something that's already challenging in, in and of itself. And so it's really important that we're kind of authentic and we carry ourselves with a, with a level of, of humility. So that's the first level of, of, of authenticity that we need to bring to our work. The next level of, of authenticity that we need to bring to our work is we need to avoid innovation theater. I define innovation theater as activities that look like innovation, growth jams, design jams, idea competitions, sticky notes, football tables, beanbags, all these things that look like innovation but ultimately create no value for the organization. It's really important that we really focus on creating value because often when leaders look at the work that we do, they need to see that where we've been able to deliver something of value to the company. We've either optimized the way the company operates, we've created new products, we've improved customer experiences, whatever it is that's actually measurable value that we bring to the organization, that's what we need to focus all of our efforts on and make sure that that's what we're doing. So that's the second layer of authenticity that, that we need. And it's really important that we don't occupy or put ourselves in a silo as innovators. I'm, not, I'm often asked this question, you know, where should innovation sit? Should innovation be allowed to sit in an innovation lab as far away from the business? And I often say, I don't really have a strong opinion on that. You can have an innovation lab that's separate from the business. You can have an innovation lab that's close to the business. The only thing I care about is whatever work is happening in that lab is not siloed from the mother company. It is work that somebody in the mother company cares that if it succeeds, they, they want to take it to scale. And that's really what we're trying to build when we're working in these, in these, in these, um, in the, in, in these situations. So then the question becomes, okay, well, how do we get that done? And so the way we get that done, right, is to really think about leadership support. I really, really strongly believe that, you know, innovation cannot succeed if it doesn't have leadership support. Without leadership support, you're basically dead on day one because at some point, somebody has to make a decision about the things you're working on and so you really need leaders that understand that they can't pick the winning idea on day one. They have to make multiple small bets in very many ideas, allow teams to test those ideas through, through, through iteration, and then leaders provide you the context in, 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 which, in which you work and the context in which the winning ideas actually em, emerge. And so in order to do that, you need leaders to really give you clear strategic guidance in terms of the things you should be working on, give you the right resources to do your work, and sort of use this portfolio your management system of making small bets that increase over time for teams that are actually showing traction. And a really great example of that is, uh, is, is Bosch, who we've been collaborating with at Strategizer. And they built this innovation framework where they invested in like 200 teams initially in the discovery phase. And then, you know, a few, uh, most of those teams failed to move to the validation phase. And those teams that failed, you know, they, 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 the, the investment in, them, in those teams stops because what we really care about is finding business models that work. And then so 60 teams move into validation until we get like 15 teams that we accelerate and, and, and sort of move to scale. And so this idea of building an innovation ecosystem where the winning ideas emerge is something we need our leaders to support. Now for this to be successful, we also need to sort of collaborate with our leaders to build a process for what we call incremental funding or what Eric Ries calls metered funding, right? Because without that, we won't be able to actually drive innovation the way we want. And so when we were working at Pearson, when I was working at Pearson with Craig Strong and Sonia Kusevich, we were part of the product lifecycle team there. And we created this sort of institution, if you want to call it, or, 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 a, or, or a function that we called product councils. And the product councils were really focused on how you make investments inside you know, into ideas and we built sort of this metered funding or incremental in, in, in investment process where early stage investments got up to 50K and then as teams that are showing more traction that get up to 250K until they got maybe up to a million dollars that they need to actually start scaling. Now, this is how we want our leaders to sort of make decisions. And you cannot do this by yourself without their support. So 
part of the work that we need to do as entrepreneurs is not just to work on our products, but to also think about what, what, what leaders are thinking about our products and services and how we might be able to get the resources we need to take those to, to scale a, a little later on. Another thing that really matters for, for, for entrepreneurs to focus on is something that we call o -o -o organizational uh, design. Now, what's interesting actually in, in the work that I've been doing is I've noticed that you know, entrepreneurs now really think about working with leaders a lot. They, they're really working on getting leadership support. That's a principle that's been accepted now, I think, by a lot of innovation teams. But, one of the, well, but, but, but a principle that's slightly neglected these days is the idea that they also need to make a contribution to organizational design really think about how they collaborate with, with their colleagues within, with, within the organization. And, you know, the, the, the real question about organizational design is how much legitimacy and power do innovators have within the organizational structure, right? And that really matters. I mean, you remember the, the you know, the, the conversation we're just having just now about, about innovation labs. I was working with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, 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 with a few teams and this becomes a real challenge when they start thinking about how they, how they work together, right? So when I was working with colleagues at, at, at TD Ameritrade, I remember having a conversation with one of the leaders there. And he said to me, you know, Tendai, when we started our innovation lab, we used to call ourselves the home for homeless ideas. But he says like over time, we actually learned that if an idea is homeless when it comes to the lab, it will be homeless when it leaves. And so it's not sufficient to call yourself a home for homeless ideas. Even if you do get homeless ideas coming to the lab, it's your job to then find them a home before they leave the lab, because otherwise the work that you do won't likely be taken to scale. So that really matters as a discipline, which means that we have to focus on getting legitimacy and power and doing this work that I call building a bridge between innovation and the core business and also making sure that we have the right incentives in, 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 in place. And so it's really important to build a bridge to the core because there's no innovation that becomes successful by itself. You need other people to be involved. So you need to work with key functions like marketing and legal and compliance. People we tend to want to avoid. We need to collaborate with those people to actually drive success. So one really great example of this is our colleagues who, who we, we, we've worked with the strategize, our colleagues at Bayer. They were working on, on, a, on, an, on an accelerator program, an internal accelerator program called the Catalyst Fund. And what they did was, they did collaboration with, with the legal and compliance teams to say, okay, we're driving this catalyst fund. What are the requirements that we need in terms of data privacy, et cetera, from, from a legal perspective in order for our innovations to be successful? And they kind of work together to remove hurdles and really create a framework that works for innovation that the legal and compliance team can also sign off. And once they've done that, it actually allowed the innovation teams to move quicker rather than have to renegotiate stuff with legal and compliance every time. And so this is work that's really important to do if we want to build legitimacy and relationships within the organization. Because remember what we're trying to be. We're trying to be pirates in the Navy. We're not just trying to be pirates. We're really trying to build a bridge between the work that we do and the core business. Right? And then finally, this is the last piece, but it is something that we've tended to focus on a lot as, as innovators. And, and it's important that we have the right innovation practice in place, that we have the right toolbox, that we're building the right skills, we have the right process management, you know, like the work, like again, the work that we were doing at, at Pearson, where we built the Lean Product Lifecycle, and then we created a playbook with the, with the right tools and processes for people to actually be able to drive the work that they're doing and do the right things as they're testing their ideas, iterating and, 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 and scaling. And so you can see that there's actually sort of three layers, right? There's leadership support, there's organizational design, and there's innovation practice as the sort of three layers that we have to drive as, as, as innovators if we want to succeed as, as pirates in the, in the Navy. But I also want to make the point that you can see that I mentioned innovation practice last because we've done this, right? We've all done this before. You do the, the, the business model canvas training workshop, the Lean Startup training workshop. And then once that workshop is done, the team that you've trained go back to work and they can't do the work anyway. And so it's really important that we build the other elements in the org design and the leadership support to ensure that the teams we're training are actually able to do the work that we're coaching them to do when they get back to, 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 their, to their day jobs. So that's really, really important. So then the question becomes, you know, as we kind of try, as we wrap up our, 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 our conversation, how do you actually put this ecosystem in place? How do you, what are the steps that you need to follow to put this ecosystem in place? Now, there are very many of us that are lucky enough to have 
significant leadership support that drives innovation within our organization. And if you're lucky enough to be in that situation, then you've got a lot of sort of legitimacy to start driving change. But even, if, but, but even then, right, you need to also be systematic about, about how you do that. But for the rest of us that are trying to build, you know, movements from the bottom up, the question is how do we start to influence our leaders to actually drive the change? And I often say to teams, don't just jump in. The one problem that I've noticed a lot with innovators is that they're impatient, they want to do stuff. So they end up just jumping onto any sort of thing. Let's do a hackathon, let's do a design jam, let's open a lab. Let's, you really need to start with discovery by studying exactly what the challenges of innovation within your, or your own organization are. Focus on those challenges and then design innovation programs that are designed to respond and manage those, those, those challenges rather than just doing whatever other people are doing in other companies or stuff that you've read about in a, in a business magazine that you think is, is, is cool to do. And then once you've decided what you want to do, my, my, my recommendation is always start with early adopters. Focus on early adopters and allies, right? You need to sort of work with people that are, that are, that are interested in, in, in innovation. And in every company that, that I've worked with, you, you can always find leaders that have been trying to drive in, innovation. I mean, so, you know, how do you find early adopters? They're typically leaders who understand the world is changing. You know, they're aware of the innovation deficit within their company, have been actively looking for solutions, they've sponsored some innovation activities, and they have time and resources to, to in, in invest. I mean, you can tell this is something I, I adapted from, from Steve Blank's sort of model of how to find, of how to find early adopters. Now, the reason why we want to work with early adopters is a lot of innovators that work with spend their time trying to convince detractors. Don't waste your time on detractors, right? Because that's just a hard job to do. What you really want to do is work with early adopters, get yourself an early win, and then use that early win to drive the changes you want, you, you want to drive, right? A really great example is the work that, you know, Claudia Koshka did when she was trying to spread design thinking practices in, 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 in PNG. She focused on getting an early win first with the Mr. Clean brand, which was, a, you know, an old stale brand. And by reviving that brand, you know, she was able to show the value of these practices to the organization. And then that gravity she created drew everybody else in to see whether they could also get similar value from there you know, from her work in their own, in their own division. So that, that really, really matters. And then you can then transition that into building a repeatable in, 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 in innovation process within your organization. The final thing I just want to say is you have to be deliberate. When you actually start doing this work, you really have to be deliberate. You have to be thinking about what is, the, what, what is your job as an entrepreneur? And I think you've got two jobs as an, as an entrepreneur. The first job you have is to make sure that you're creating new growth or driving value for your organization. But in order for you to do that in a way that's lasting, you also need to transform and change the culture within your organization. So you've got these two jobs of growth and transformation, and that's what you really need to drive within, within the company. Now, what we tend to do is we, we are very deliberate. So if, if you work in a company one day, you'll find that somebody started an innovation lab, another person started a skills and learning program, another person started a venture capital, corporate venture capital thing, another person opened an innovation outpost, and then before you know it, you've got all these little fires everywhere, an entrepreneurship program here, a partnership program here, a center of excellence there, right? And nobody's really thinking, what is the job of all these things we're just launching, right? So it's really important that we're really deliberate and really start assessing and mapping and analyzing the work that we're doing in terms of what value it, it, it's actually creating. And that way we're able to build this sort of sustainable innovation ecosystem where there's a bridge between our work and the work that's happening within, within, within the core business. So just to wrap up the talk, I'd like to ask you a poll question, which is our, which are, which is our second and final poll of, 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 of the day, right? When you think about the innovation programs that are currently running within your organization, right? You know, what impact are they actually having? Are they creating new growth? Are they transforming the company? Are they doing both or, or are they doing none of that? So if we could launch the, the second poll, please. So you can see that, you know, a lot of the work there, the winning concept is, you know, transforming the company. There's the people that are doing both. I think the thing that concerns me the most is when you find programs that do neither. That's where the problem really lies in, in, in the work that we do, because for those of you that vote, voted that your, you know, the innovation programs that your company are doing neither, not creating new growth, not transforming the company, that's a real example of innovation theater right there. 
And we really need to really focus on making sure that we're building the right coalitions within our organization. And that's the best way for us to really scale innovation and make it a sustainable process within, within our business. And so the book is Pirates in the Navy. If you want to learn more about the work that I'm doing, and then uh, yeah, pick it up. It's now available on, 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 on Amazon. And uh, thank you very much for your time. I will now um, jump into Q&A. The first thing I need to do, I think, is press escape. And then I can um, open the Q, uh, the question and answer box and see what people have been asking there. So how do you get top managers involved? So one of the ways to get top managers involved is to work with early adopters. So before we, before we get started, right, it's really about doing discovery work and, and, and sort of finding out which are the leaders that are really interested in innovation, right? And so, you know, the way, that's the best way to get support from, 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 from the leadership team. Don't try and like target everybody. Kind of go a little bit underground, have conversations within, within the organization and find out which leaders are really supportive of innovation team or of, of innovation and are keen and are early adopters. And then work with those leaders to sort of help them get an early win. If you help those early adopter leaders get an early win, those are the leaders that then help you drive the rest of the program and, and, and recruit their colleagues, right? I think one of the problems I've noticed is that people tend to walk around with a PowerPoint presentation and try to convince leaders to, to, to sort of you know, to participate. And that's, that's the worst way to do it. Get early adopters, get an early win, and then use the early win to, 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 to drive the change that, that you want. Second question, what are the... Uh, common blockers for innovation that I've come across. One of the, well, one of the, one of the common blockers is, is the, you know, the, the tension between running a core business and sort of driving in, in, in innovation. So the common blocker is that leaders just don't, will not dedicate time and resource to make sure that innovation actually succeeds. And so, you know, if, if, if CEOs or leaders will not give, if, if it's not even on the agenda and nobody is actually working on it, that really becomes a, a problem. So the question is, how do we get it on the, on the, on the, on the, on the agenda? Also, another blocker is if we try and manage innovation, right, we're using the same processes we use to manage the core business, that also creates a blocker because innovation pro projects never look as good as existing projects when you're using the same metrics to, to, to analyze them. Have you tried to run strategy sessions in a big four? A big four, the big four accounting firm? I'm just assuming it's a big four consulting firm. No, I have not but I have run strategy sessions in Fortune 500 companies, and we have a, a way of doing that, which is we, you know, helping people think about the future and then prioritize the things that they want to, to sort of work on. And then another question is, why do lots of companies treat innovation teams as consultants? I think that's what the, yeah, as expendable third parties. And I think it's because two parts, because innovation is also, Innovation is never seen as a, as, a, as a priority. So innovation doesn't have legitimacy and power, which is why it's really important to move from being just pirates to becoming privateers so that we get institutional support. The more innovation is institutionalized, the less we're treated as, expend, as, as expendable third parties. Now, what's interesting is that a lot of innovators that I work with, they don't ever focus on trying to get that to actually happen. They're more asking for labs and asking for resources and those kinds of things. So, so I think that's really important, right? Yeah. How to make innovation an important part of the culture. I think that's sort of connected to the question that I just answered there. So thank you very much. I think I have to stop now because it's two o'clock. Um, thank you for joining a, a really interesting conversation. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.